we can put these in the shops, we can gather customer feedback, and we can start to grow this business. So there's two of them at the moment. Uh, we're getting very, very good feedback on them. And a couple of the products which uh, we put into them uh, is a fantastic powdered paint, uh, which means that you take all the water uh, out of paint. And of course, paint requires a huge amount of water in it, and that is transported all over the country, taking up masses of room on trucks and shelf space and everything else. And the powdered paint that we put in there gets around uh, all those issues. Uh, another one uh, is a product re called Green Spirit, which is essentially white spirit, but solvent-free, therefore with none of the downsides uh, of white spirit. So these are product areas that we're moving into and trialing, not necessarily closed loop, but we are now trying to give the buyers the chance to actually be able to experiment with some stuff. Okay, closing loops um, and skills. So the other thing that we need to talk about uh, in terms of closed loop is the sort of training and the sort of education and the sort of change that we need to drive. Um, and let's look at diversity. Uh, it's a key element of any sustainable system, and unfortunately, it's something that we're blessed with at B&Q. Now, we've been fostering a diverse work for workforce for many years because we know it to be valuable. Um, now, let's look at one, one aspect of that, age diversity. Uh, now, this is an area where we've been very strong. Uh, Sid Pryor is our eldest member of staff. Now, Sid is 96, and he joined the company when he was 76. So I will probably have retired by the time uh, that uh, I get to the age, Sid, uh, the age at which Sid uh, joined B&Q. Now, the government's raid, uh, has recognised the impact of having an ageing population uh, and is now increasing the default retirement age. They've even praised our approach for recruiting older people. Uh, a quarter of our workforce uh, is over 50, uh, yet the government skills force, uh, focused mainly on youngsters, does nothing to uh, aid us as an employer to retrain staff. So we live in fast and changing times, uh, and when government is striving to encourage people to work when they're older, they cannot expect the skills they have when they left education or subsequently gained during the first careers will still be applicable for employers. So we are absolutely committed to bringing on the younger generation and working with uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to breed the skills into that generation to take us into this new age. But I think the key point we would like to make is if you look at our workforce, they are made up of all sorts of ages, and it would be fantastic also if we as an employer are able to breed this new generation of skills in the older workforce, uh, like Sid uh, and like Terry here. Terry is our oldest apprentice. Terry is 76 uh, and is undertaking an apprenticeship at the moment. So we would very much like to bring these guys into the loop uh, as an employer. So, why does B&Q want a sustainable future? Well, having heard all that, you may wonder why we want to take on this challenge. Why would we want to bother to strive for a sustainable future? Well, without a doubt, it's easier to trade today than to worry about tomorrow, but ultimately, that is a fool's game. If you want to secure a long-term prosperous future for B&Q, you have to trade well today and keep a firm eye on tomorrow. And we've had many examples in recent years of businesses that have failed to do this. Now, if we take, for example, Woolworths, that was a business which was enormously successful on the British High Street for very, very many years. And although the reasons for its demise weren't environmental, it is a very good example of a business failing to look down the tracks, failing to see what's coming, and not understanding how it has to change, and essentially placing short-term profitability gains ahead of any real consideration of how the business has to evolve to meet a new age. Um, and I think that the same can be said about sustainability. Uh, it offers businesses both threats and opportunities, but you have to acknowledge uh, what these are to take advantage of the opportunities and avoid disaster from the threats. Now, we've already seen that in three years, our eco product range represents 10% of our total sales. Uh, I'm confident that the sales opportunities could be worth significantly more, uh, but the prize we're exploring here is not whether we're able to add some more sales to the bottom line, but it's about securing our very future uh, as a retailer. Um, there's a lot of debate going on at the moment about peak oil. Uh, that's the point at which the maximum rate of oil extraction is reached before going into decline. In fact, reading this morning, some people may think that has happened as in 2006, is actually behind us. Uh, now, as retailers, we don't know whether that's true or not. But what we do know is that demand through the world, uh, for oil in the world is dramatically increasing, mainly from countries like India and China. Um, but supply isn't rising in, in line with demand, so oil is, start, is going to start to become more expensive. Indeed, once the demand curve for oil starts bumping up against the production curve, oil prices are likely to skyrocket. Now, for being q uh, oil is, peak oil isn't just about whether we can afford to heat our stores in winter. It's about whether we can continue to source, manufacture, and move the products onto our shelves to enable us to continue to open. 
how we source and use financial resources, what we sell and how we sell, it's about sustainability. And what you quickly come to realize then is that sustainability isn't a nice thing or a USP. It's fundamental to securing the future of our business. Therefore, whilst it might be difficult, and there may be many obstacles to overcome, what makes sense is a, in a closed loop system is that as finite resources become scarce and the price to resource relationship changes, closing the resource and materials loop begins to make sense as a business model because you can ultimately buy your raw materials once and reuse them. Mitigating price inflation from your balance sheet, you're effectively finding ways to cycle valuable materials so when the prices do go up, your business is protected. So, where are we now? Well, uh, it's been a great year for us. We've had a couple of very nice awards. And for us, we recognised the importance of sustainability many years ago. And indeed, the business's journey towards becoming a sustainable retailer started more, more than two decades ago when we helped establish the Forestry Stewardship Council. Uh, we now lead the retail industry with our timber sourcing policies. And whilst we've had some other notable achievements on the way since then, it wasn't until 2006 when we teamed up with Bioregional that we took the strategic decision to put our CSR agenda at the heart of our business and the One Planet Home initiative was born. Now the concept to live within the means of One Planet has always been challenging to us to think differently about how we operate our business. And Bioregional strengths are helping business like, businesses like ours to find and implement practical sustainability solutions. We've already had some success. We've cut our emissions by 20% without resorting to offsetting. Now, it's very early days on our journey, and many of the difficult questions about how we do things more sustainably are already being asked. We're already making changes and finding solutions. And the One Planet Home Programme initiative has two initiatives, to help us reduce our own operational impacts as a business and help our customers reduce their own impact at home. And this is no doubt paving the way for us to take some of that to the next level to see where we might close the loop. Now, one of the elements that we have looked at in terms of moving towards a closed-loop system is the elimination of waste. We've already had some success in this. As I said, we've hit a very high percentage recycling target, and this has led to us adopting some early closed-loop practices, and I'd like to share some of these uh, with you. Now, whether these are 100% closed-loop or not, uh, I'm not sure, but I'm just going to take you through some of the examples. Now, the first thing here is the carrier pack. Um, B&Q is the UK's largest retailer of kitchens and bathrooms. Uh, we install about 35,000 kitchens uh, a year, and I think we sell in the region of 4,000 kitchens a week. So as you can see, the scale of this is absolutely enormous. And one of the problems that we had was that we, when we delivered kitchen worktops, we delivered them in a one-time use cardboard outer. And what we experienced was a very high level of damage uh, to the units themselves, uh, and enormously high packaging cost. So we did some work with RAP where we just asked them to come up with an alternative packaging solution, and what they came up was the carrier pack. Uh, and the carrier pack uh, moves us from single-use cardboard uh, into using significant amounts of uh, plastic and polystyrene to a purpose-use uh, purpose reusable pl um, pack, which is made of 45% recyclable con uh, content with the added bonus of being recyclable at the end of its life. Now, on average, we get between 45 and 80 uses out of these before they go back to be recycled again. And ultimately, what we saw was some fantastic side benefits, which we perhaps hadn't expected. We saw a massive reduction in damage, massive reduction in the level of damaged product, and subsequently a reduction in damaged worktops. Uh, it was quicker to pack and unpack the product, so it saved an awful lot of time. Uh, we saw a reduction of 1,200 tonnes of cardboard entering our supply chain and then being disposed of, albeit recycled. And we saved more than a million pounds a year on packaging costs. Now, since it's launched the Carrier Packs 1 2 Star Pack Awards, uh, and it really has been uh, a phenomenal success. So, here is an example of where we have something which actually is getting towards closed loop and is really generating short term benefits for us. Um, another product that we have and we're experimenting with uh, in the eco shops. Uh, is giving new pa uh, old paint new life. Now, it's a little-known statistic, but 17, uh, every household has roughly 17 tins of partially used paint <laughs> underneath its stairs, or in its cellar, or in its attic. And this stuff mainly goes to landfill. And what we found was a little company down in Chichester who were doing a fantastic thing. They were going to local uh, recycling centres, and they were picking up the paint, and they were taking it back to a garage, literally a garage, sorting it into separate colours, uh, blending it, and then putting it back into tins, and then selling it back out again. 
And for every tin of this you buy, you avoid three partially used tins of paint going into landfill. Now again, not strictly closed loop, but it is a fantastic example of how you can minimize environmental damage by using waste. And I think that this is a, a really groundbreaking initiative which we're very keen to take nationwide. The issue of it, of course, as it always is, is infrastructure, is being able to get a sufficient quantity of paint in the right localities to be able to do this. And again, our model is highly centralized at the moment. All of our products go via central distribution, you know, big distribution centers. We have some regional ones, but primarily there's a north one and next year a south one. So this would require us to move to a more local sourcing model. So again, you know, there is so much innovation and so much potential out there. The key thing is getting the infrastructure and the scale for us to be able to manage it. So this is a really great product that we're working on. Um, this is one we're really, really excited about, um, and uh, the vendor of which is somewhere in the room. Where is he? Where's Steve? There we go. Um, one of the biggest things that we put out uh, into uh, the waste streams uh, of the UK uh, is polystyrene. We sell an enormous amount of bedding plants, massive number of bedding plants in these big polystyrene trays. Now, expanded polystyrene is a fantastic packaging material. Sadly, that's why so much of it gets used. It's highly impact resistant. It's very, very rigid. It has insulating qualities. Finding an alternative to EPS uh, is actually relatively difficult. Um, but what these guys have done uh, is to take expanded polystyrene foam and then find a way of compacting it and turning it into deck board. So we think this is a great example of upcycling. This is essentially something taking something which has a very, very short product life, which is essentially created and then used and then goes straight into landfill and actually taking it compacting it, turning into something which has a very, very long life. And I don't know how long the average person keeps their deck for, but it's quite a long time. But if they keep it for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, it's fine. Because styrenes are very, very uh, adaptable, you can take it, you can shred it, you can remold it, you can do anything with it. So again, I think this is a fantastic move forward. Again, the problem as ever will be infrastructural. Po expanded polystyrene uh, is extremely light, it's extremely bulky. How do you get in place a distribution infrastructure that allows you to get it back to central places to be able to process it and then get it out efficiently? And also as a retailer, how do you tell the person who buys a piece of deck board that, look, when you don't want it in 20 years time, we'll be here to take it back. Uh, now, like I say, you know, we intend to be a sustainable business and we intend to be around for a good deal more than another 40 years. But again, you know, this is the, the, it isn't that there is a lack of innovation in the supply chain. There's a massive amount of innovation in the supply chain. The trick is actually building it to the sort of scale that we need and building the infrastructure around it. Um, but this is a fantastic product. And we took it and showcased it at uh, Project Start, the Prince of Wales' sustainability initiative in the summer. And the reaction from people who saw it was overwhelming. I mean, they were literally blown away and said, well, that's absolutely fantastic. Why would I want to use uh, anything else? So uh, another really great example. Um, and really uh, a final example, uh, which is uh, BioBoard. Um, and this is something that we are working on uh, with, York, with York University. Uh, and essentially, this is taking waste products from the agricultural industry uh, and then turning them into MDF. Now, MDF uh, is a product which relies upon timber. Uh, it frequently has quite a lot of formaldehyde in it, uh, and there are increasing levels of concern around uh, its, uh, the potential health impacts of MDF and people are looking for all alternative. Um, and essentially, this product uh, is made from wheat stalks or rice husks or other uh, farm wastes. And what they're essentially doing is they're splitting the waste material into two piles and then they're burning them in one into an ash and using the energy off that. And then the ash forms a natural glue and then they use this to bond the remaining stalks together. So now this is, this is not available in stores yet. Um, there are a huge amount of trials and development work to be undertaken. But again, you know, as a retailer, we sell, as you can imagine, an enormous quantity of MDF. So 